Registration for our Mindfulness Fertility Series is now open. This is a six-week live online group program. This program is a must if you have an IUI or an IVF coming up and is essential for anyone trying to get pregnant naturally. Whether you are stuck catastrophizing about the future or ruminating about the past, we'll help you reframe your thoughts, reduce anxiety, and create a solid mindset for pregnancy success. Class starts Thursday, April the 25th, and space is very limited. Go to FabFertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com, and click on Shop Mindfulness Fertility Series to register. That's FabFertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com, and click on Shop Mindfulness Fertility Series to register. I mean, I think generally, you know, when I see skin issues, those are a sign of something deeper. Mm -hmm. Your skin is a big organ of elimination. So the way that we eliminate toxins, you know, we conjugate them in our liver, which means we make them fat soluble to water soluble. So we can excrete them in our stool, in our urine and in our skin when we sweat. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark and my mission is to inspire, motivate and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today I'm welcoming Dr. Christine Mayer into the podcast and we're digging into the connection between acne and fertility. Christine Marin is a functional medicine physician and the founder of a high-tech innovative medicine a medical practice. She was born and raised in Colorado by parents who promoted an active lifestyle and good nutrition. This upbringing inspired an interest in holistic medicine at an early age, but it was her own personal health challenges with chronic digestive issues, autoimmunity, hypothyroidism, gluten intolerance, and recurrent pregnancy loss that motivated her to study functional medicine. Using the functional medicine model, she works with patients to identify and treat the root causes of chronic disease. Her approach to patient care is individualized and personalized with an emphasis on the ways our environment food, and lifestyle choices interact with our genes. Dr. Marin is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. She's a compassionate clinician, speaker, and wellness advocate. She's married to a surgeon and together they balance rewarding careers with raising three beautiful children. Learn more at Dr. So drchristinemarin.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Christine. Welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, let's uh, dig into your story. And really, I find most people that I speak to in this line of work with functional medicine, they have their own personal story of how they came to it. So you can... Yeah, don't we all? Yes. Um, yeah, well, my, my story really was uncovered through challenges with pregnancies. Um, I was actually a pretty healthy kid growing up. Didn't have a lot of issues. I mean, I went to college and had some hormonal issues and acupuncture was great for me. And, you know, I had a really holistic upbringing and sort of a holistic perspective to begin with. Um, but, you know, I was pretty healthy. Um, looking back in retrospect, I can see these little um, sort of warning signs uh, with um, mainly, you know, actually acne was was one of those warning signs. Um, and I would just get like really sick sometimes with foods like um, gastroenteritis or something like that. But, you know, truly I was like a pretty healthy kid, um, but I would put healthy in quotes, right? Because later on I kind of uncovered everything through functional medicine. So, but really my um, sort of dive into all of this started with pregnancies. I had my first daughter when I was a resident. I was doing, so after medical school, I was doing my family medicine residency. And um I got pregnant very easily with her actually, but then was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And that was just sort of like out of nowhere, no family history, no risk factors, you know, normal weight gain. And I just felt like, what is this about? You know, there's something else here. Why am I intolerant to carbohydrates? And um, I really dove into sort of holistic nutrition at that point. I mean, as I said, I was more holistic to begin with anyways, but when I heard the conventional dietary recommendations, I was like, yeah, right. That's <laughs> not going to work. Um, and it doesn't work. I mean, I checked my blood sugar four times a day and I knew exactly what happened when I eat, when I ate certain foods. And so I got to really understand the impact that food had on my body. And, um, at that time I wasn't actually gluten-free 
I should have been, um, but I didn't know um, that that was an issue for me. So I really became interested in it then. And then postpartum still really questioned like, what, what's this about? Why did I have gestational diabetes? It just doesn't make sense. What am I missing? What's the deal? What's the link? Um, so fast forward several years later, uh, and my husband and I tried for our second pregnancy, and we had a lot of trouble getting pregnant, and we had recurrent pregnancy loss. And that's when um, I got s really serious. Um, that's when I went gluten-free and really dove into functional medicine and started uh, really a journey that sort of linked my personal passions and my professional life very closely because obviously I started practicing specializing in functional medicine mm -hmm. um, after that point. But um, once I really started diving into it, um, you know, I knew something was wrong with me, actually. Um, my husband was, you know, tried to be very reassuring. It's not your fault. And, but I just knew deep down, like, there is something wrong with my body. There's something going on. And I need to figure it out. And I had, I was, you know, um, there was no diagnosis. It was sort of unexplained pregnancy loss. So, and I had that work up, you know, with a fertility specialist and, um, so at that point in my life, um, I got very serious about nutrition and specifically eliminating foods like gluten and dairy and egg. And, um, unfortunately, you know, had to go on a pretty restrictive diet for some time. Um, and then I got really serious about addressing my digestive problems because simultaneously my digestive problems got really bad. So, um, I really dove into that. I, I had a lot of candida overgrowth and SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, I also discovered that I had a suboptimal thyroid function. I started treating that and really working on optimizing my thyroid through nutrients like iodine and selenium and zinc and all that. Um, I also had root canals removed. Um, I had some dental work that was done back in med school and sort of tracing it back once I, I got into my functional medicine timeline, I realized, oh, all this digestive stuff started after I got these root canals. And anyways, I had them extracted, um, which was a, a, a tricky choice, right? Like I didn't actually want to have my teeth taken out, but have never regretted that one. Um, and then I really discovered some environmental toxins. Um, I was very, you know, living very green and clean, but we had some issues um, in the house that we discovered. And um, so I just really, I got into um, just cleaning up my house and cleaning up my environment. And now I'm like uber mindful about that and um, have done everything possible to uh, protect my family and myself. But, um, you know, fast forward, we had a successful second pregnancy. I did have complications with that pregnancy in my um, platelets were low, you know, and again, I just knew there's something going on. So, um, I, my health got a lot better after that. I mean, it was sort of, you know, it's a progressive thing and it's been many years now. Um, and I feel much better now. And it's funny when I started to feel really good, I had a surprise pregnancy. So I have three kids now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's like when your body is functioning really well, your fertility comes back. And I tell my patients that like, Hey, just so you know, like as you start to feel better, um, you might, you know, need to be more careful <laughs> and look at me. So, um, so I have three lovely children and, um, giant binder full of functional medicine testing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, yeah, thank, thanks for sharing that. And I, yeah, as I say, you kind of, it, it is this little road we kind of, kind of come along here and yep. as we discover things and then we dig deeper and deeper and like, oh my goodness. And then, um, yeah. And then being in the field to be able to help others is, is so uh, rewarding and empowering. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, and today we wanted to, to dig into really the connection you mentioned a little bit there in your, in your personal story. And I had the same thing for, for me. Um, I wanted to dig a little more into to acne. And for me, I had perfect, like really great skin during my teenage years. And all of a sudden my early twenties, all of a sudden yeah. I remember getting married and I'm like, why is my yeah, like chin so good yep, totally like, yeah like, what has happened so yep. um and I, I speak with a lot of women that are struggling with infertility and then they, and they have skin issues so i wanted to, to, to dig into that so what's what, what do you th see as the connection between um acne or other skin problems and, and fertility? yeah i mean i think generally you know when i see skin issues those are a sign of something deeper mm -hmm. um 
your skin is a big organ of elimination. So the way that we eliminate toxins, you know, we conjugate them in our liver, which means we make them fat soluble to water soluble. So we can excrete them in our stool, in our urine and in our skin when we sweat and breast milk, but that's another story. But, um, you know, so the skin is, is an organ of elimination. So I think it's, um, it's influenced by environmental toxins, but it's also this sign of underlying inflammation. And where is that coming from? And it, you know, that's just, I mean, what's the root cause? I mean, that can be any number of things for different people, whether that's a food sensitivity or an environmental toxin or gut health. Um, in Chinese medicine, they say the skin is the face of the gut. So um, that's often one of the first places I look. I mean, with most patients, I'm first looking at, at gut health and digestive health and then sort of going from there. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with skin issues, whether it's acne or, you know, a lot of people have keratosis pilaris, which is like that chicken skin on the back of the arms, yeah, um, or different that. types of rashes and eczema. Yeah. I used to have that on the back, on the back mm -hmm. of the legs, the back of the arms. Yeah. Yep. Me too. I'm like, why is that so ugly? Yeah. And dry and mm -hmm. I know it took me, I mean, I was reading about it. I tried every, mm -hmm. you know, over the counter topical, whatever, and it never got better until I treated my gut. And actually it got better when I worked on the fungal issues. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I don't, there's never been any case reports that I'm aware of on this, but I think, you know, potentially for a lot of people, there's a, a link with keratosis pilaris and um, fungal issues, but I don't know. And that's definitely what I, yeah, I had fungal issues and yeah. food sensitivities and gut infections. They had the whole thing. And now the arms and the legs are smooth. So that's good. Uh, yeah. But it's never some perfect, um, you know, beauty yeah. here, but, but yeah. So, um, and I guess with sort of, we go and dig into the acne piece here with, um, and so a lot of times for when people have acne, they're either treated with potentially antibiotics or um, Accutane. A lot of the times, uh, I, I, like a, hu a first line defense is to go using uh, hormonal birth control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. And, oh, the irony, you know, yeah. it's like antibiotics and birth control both mess with the microbiome, mm -hmm. the microbiome being this collection of organisms in our gut. Um, and really that, you know, that microbiome, the balance is really important. I mean, it's like a rainforest. If you kill some stuff off, then the bad stuff grows. So um, yeah, I mean, it is a bit of irony that we, you know, treat the problem with more problem. Mm -hmm. Um and then Accutane is interesting. I mean, as you pro I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I had some friends on Accutane and they had like the driest lips on the planet. Um, but, you know, Accutane can, well, it is very harsh on mucous membranes. And so that includes the digestive tract. So um, there is some risk actually with, I mean, mucosal damage is a big thing, but like Accutane in particular and birth control actually both have some association with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I'm not sure that we know the exact link for birth control, but with Accutane, it's obvious because it causes mucosal damage. Hmm. Yeah, I just did an interview with uh, Angie Alt from Autoimmune Wellness. And mm, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, she did the study with um, uh, going, switching to the AIP diet, and within six weeks, people with IBD, they went into 73% uh, went into clinical. Uh, yeah which is mm -hmm. insane uh, to have that validated in uh, mm -hmm. med. Okay. Yeah. And so, and how do we with, so we have an imbalance and so we've, it's showing up on our skin, which then is, you know, a direct reflection of our gut. So then how do we then look to, to, in, to improve that with, as it relates to fertility? Well, I think it's really important to first identify the root cause and why the imbalance is there in the first place. And so, like I said, gut is like this primary place to, to look um, and, you know, address. Um, but I mean, and it depends where the imbalance is. I mean, the, the pattern I see a lot is high estrogen and low progesterone. And that balance is very important between estrogen and progesterone. So that's what we call estrogen dominance. Um, so improving progesterone, um, a lot of it comes through stress management. Um, and then there's, you know, there's certain supplements we can use as well to improve progesterone. Um, Chase Tree or Vitex is one of my favorites there. And then really working on that balance by decreasing some of the excess estrogens, if that's a problem. So um, for some patients I use, I mean, it depends in which phase you're having issues. And I think you use the Dutch test also. So drag urine test for complete hormones. That's where I really like to look. So I look at phase one and phase two detox of estrogen, where the problem is, if we need to support, 
you know, um, detoxification in the liver. So there's some really important enzymes in the liver. We can support those with um, certain foods like cruciferous vegetables and rosemary and turmeric, sort of anti-inflammatory foods um, and supplements. So um, DIM and indol 3 carbonyl are some of the good ones that I sometimes use. And then just supporting the liver too. So liver detoxification, maybe it's like milk thistle or um, sometimes I use glutathione. Um, and then phase two detoxification is really through a gene called COMT. So COMT you can support through magnesium and B6. And it just depends. I mean, I really like to look at the data first rather than give somebody 12 supplements, you know? So, um, so I often, I often just kind of pick a couple and really work on digestive health as well, because that's a big central role in detoxification of estrogens, um, is through having a good bowel movement every day. Um, so constipation is like a big, huge issue for that. So. Mm-hmm. A lot of women think it's yeah normal to to go to the bathroom every yeah. two three yeah. days, or that if it's yeah. like it's like little yeah. rabbit turds or it's, yeah. you know, yeah. which then can be an indicator potentially of a thyroid issue, which you said yeah. you struggle right. with. Can you totally. talk about that a little bit, me? Yeah, so thyroid is interesting. I mean, many people have hypothyroidism, um, and they know it because it's very frank, and it's they have overt hypothyroidism that has been diagnosed from, you know, a conventional doctor because they had a very high TSH. Um, and oftentimes those people have autoimmune thyroid disease, but don't necessarily know it when they get to me, then I look at their antibodies to thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin. And I can tell them, yes, this is autoimmune thyroid disease. This is Hashimoto's. And that's an important piece to know, I think, because it's a two part problem. Number one is replacing thyroid hormones. So you have optimal thyroid function, but that doesn't do anything about the antibody issue. So number two is really addressing the immune system through guts, gut health and environmental issues. Um, I talked to my patients about this triad of autoimmunity. That's through work from Alessio Fasano. Um, but we look at, you know, there's this triad. So genetic predisposition, we really can't do anything about, but we can do a whole lot about the other two, which is an environmental trigger and intestinal permeability. So I spend a lot of time talking about gut health. Um, but the other side of thyroid is that you could have non-autoimmune um, hypothyroid. And often those people just have a less than optimal thyroid function. So maybe their TSH is four, three even, um, or sometimes their TSH is really maybe more in a normal range, but they have a really low free T3. So um, do you want me to explain how TSH? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so TSH is, is the way of, uh, your brain's way of telling your thyroid to make more hormone. When it doesn't see enough, it usually goes up. So it's a pretty good indicator of hypothyroid when it's high. However, when it's normal, it doesn't rule out a problem. So we can look at T4, or free T4 in the blood, and that's a measure of how your thyroid is making T4. Or if you're on medication, sometimes, you know, a synthroid is T4. And then we have to convert that T4 to T3 in the peripheral tissues. And that conversion is a huge issue for some people. Um, So the people who don't do well on Synthroid, who are treated for hypothyroidism, generally are not converting very well. And so their T3, their free T3 in their blood work looks low. So um, usually labs have a cutoff of like 2.3 or 2.5. I've seen it between 2.2 and 2.4, but generally I find people have a lot of um, symptoms if they're less than maybe 2.7. But I find a lot of people in this range um, where they're in the, in the twos for their free T3 and that feels really bad. Um, And then I look at reverse T3. So our body has this way of shunting um, thyroid hormone to reverse T3, which is like the brakes free T3 would be the gas And we make a lot of reverse T3 at times of high stress, trauma, infection, low calorie diet. And it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective when you think like, oh, you're sick. So you want to shut your metabolism down. But in our modern world, it doesn't, you know, make a lot of sense for us. So, um, so yeah, I think that, you know, addressing that and really knowing a full thyroid panel is important, including antibodies. Yeah. We see this all the time. And a lot of times, most Mm -hmm. times people have been said that, you know, their thyroid is normal. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. So when they have unexplained infertility and then further, yeah. 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 there's undiagnosed, you know, Hashimoto's or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fertility doctors tend to be better about looking at a TSH and keeping the range of normal, um, pretty tight. So, um, but you know, if you go to a primary care doctor, I mean, they're generally, they're going off of lab ranges and it goes up to four and a half. I mean, even literature that endocrinologists read would suggest that two and a half um, would be the upper limit of normal. So 
um, yeah. And I just had a patient the other day and she's like, I know something's been wrong. I have all these hypothyroid symptoms, but my TSH is normal. And we really, we looked at her full panel and she has Hashimoto. She had no idea. She's been seeing somebody for like 10 years complaining of hair loss and feeling really cold and fatigued. And you know, it's like her TSH is normal, but nothing else is. Yeah. So yeah, we have the same situations where people, yeah. yeah. Unexplained infertility and wait a minute, that's yep. discover. Um, okay, and so as far as the role of, of diet, so you did mention some, um, so a little bit of diet, dietary strategies there. As far as for, if we look at it from the, the acne or the skin side of things, which that is a reflection of the gut, what are um, some, some diet strategies that you can recommend? Well, I think it's always great to go through an elimination diet and really try to figure out what you might be sensitive to. Um, I think I personally like to do food sensitivity testing and I, I was back and forth on that for a while because it is not a perfect test and I think it's important that you really understand how to interpret it. But if you do a simple IgG food sensitivity test, I think it can be just gives, give patients some really more objective data that helps them to decide like where they need to take their elimination diet. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people who react to egg and I love egg and egg yolk has choline, which is super important when you're trying to get pregnant. But um, unfortunately, it elicits an immune reaction in a lot of people. So I mean, the most common reactions I see in my clinic are gluten, dairy, and egg. And then there's, you know, sometimes people react to different things like nuts or lectins or, you know, whatever else it might be. So um, I think that an elimination diet is a really good idea. If you have the ability to do a food sensitivity uh, test before the elimination diet, I think that's even better. And then as you start to reincorporate those foods, that can give you some guide. I also tell patients though, I think it's really important that it's an elimination diet and it's temporary. It's not forever. And I really, um, you know, I see patients who have been sort of AIP for like two years and they just can't ever bring the food back. So I try to help patients address the underlying issue for the reactivity to food, which I think is usually gut related because they have intestinal permeability issues. So if we can kind of heal and seal the gut, then I like to really broaden the diet as much as possible. Now, usually that doesn't include dairy or gluten, especially if somebody's reacting to it, but I try to keep the diet as diverse as possible. Yeah, we do the same thing with the, the elimination diet. And then we, in the beginning, we weren't necessarily doing as many of the food sensitivity tests. And now it's sort of, because we seem, seem to attract people like type A, just especially in, in fertility. Yeah. They mm -hmm. want to get results faster. So to have the food yes, sensitivity totally. test to say, okay, look, here's what it is. Let's tweak it. You know, take the yellow out for 60, then the red for 90, and then tweak that further. And then, then looking at stool testing to, to heal the gut along the way. So mm -hmm. it's kind of yeah. it's really, because I've in the past had a food sensitivity uh, come, uh, test come back. I still hadn't healed my gut. I came back intolerant to all my favorite foods. Yeah. It was, you know, yeah. like at that point I was gluten, dairy free and corn free. And I got this test back and I really wanted to like throw it out the window because it was like, I what know. do I eat? Yeah. But, right. Um, so yeah. it can be kind of a little bit crazy if, if it's coming back and you have a major. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important, like whoever is interpreting that test, I try to really walk them through it. Like if we see everything come up with leaky gut and we just have to work on Yep. getting diversity in a rotational diet and getting rid of the big ones. I mean, we can't put you on a diet of like, literally I had somebody see me um, who was like, all I can eat is green beans and cranberry. I'm like, well, I can guarantee you you're now reacting to green beans and cranberry because you're going to react to what you see every day. You know, I mean, your immune system is going to react to the things that you eat the most often. So, um, so in patients like that, I just say, this is basically a surrogate marker for leaky gut. Let's really work on removing the big ones and working on diversity. And I try also not to spend like, you know, a thousand dollars on food sensitivity testing um, because I haven't found the really, really expensive ones to be any more helpful than the two hundred dollar ones. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I have noticed with some clients too that their that acne, um, obviously during the elimination period, it can it can get worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it could even it could even take months to kind of actually leave the sleep. Yeah get better. So what's your take on that? Well, um, you just reminded me of this other piece to skin, which is, you know, we talk about leaky gut. There's also leaky skin. So there's literature that's come out more recently um, in the dermatology community to look at the rate of 
peanut allergies among children with eczema. And by treating their eczema really aggressively, they've reduced the rate of peanut allergy. So we're talking about two different things here when we talk about allergy and sensitivity because there's the IgE allergies and then this IgG is sensitivity. So it is different arms of the immune system, but um, it's interesting then to look at the skin, whether it's eczema or keratosis pilaris or acne or whatever it might be, and then how that might influence the way that our immune system reacts to different foods. So I don't really think that's the answer to your question. Um, <laughs> the answer to your question is why is, there, why is there acne getting worse? And I don't know. I don't know why that, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, sometimes it's the, it's continuing like to help with the, the liver and being doing all those, those kind of strategies with, with detoxing with the sauna and the milk thistle and the dandelion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they just start to detox through the yeah. skin. Yeah. So, yeah. And then after months and we're like, oh, wait, now the skin is clear. Mm -hmm. And then someone goes on and, and has, if they're potentially intolerant to very highly sensitive to gluten, they have it again. And then it comes back in full force. Yeah. Yeah, and I noticed this um, actually with, with with my daughter. Her her trigger for um, when she has gluten, it goes right right to her skin. And mm -hmm. she's seventeen, and what seventeen year old wants to have yeah, right? You know, acne. Um, but you know, when you know when she stays away from it, her skin is great. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just this underlying sort of sign of inflammation, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so um, we talked a lot about gut health here. And so in, in our, our practice here, we, we do, uh, we use the GI map. And look yeah, at, me too. Yeah, okay. Um, so we look at, so it's basically to see if there's parasites or bacterial overgrowth, fungal infection. I'd say the majority of people that we work with that are struggling with infertility, when we do that stool test, something comes back. It's never, it's, oh, yeah. it's never perfect. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, even know if, I mean, what's, what's your take on this? I'm not even sure if that's just the fact is that our population that everyone's got something going on in there if, mm -hmm. or, or is it, I, I don't know. Yeah. What's, what's, uh, it's funny. I mean, we definitely see skewed populations, right? So like right. everybody we yeah. test has an issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't taken a healthy group, quote healthy of, um, people and done a GI map, right? Cause nobody wants to spend the money on it. Um, I have tested actually a few people where they really don't have, I mean, plenty of people actually where they have other issues, but no digestive symptoms and their GI map looks bad. Mm -hmm. um, one patient comes to mind, she's Hashimoto's. She's like the perfect poops, um, but she has blastocystis and you know, a lot of other things going on. So, and SIBO actually. So, but she doesn't have the bloating and other issues. So anyhow, um, yeah, I mean, I do the GI map. I also do organic acid testing. So I really like Great Plains has a moat or an oat test that mm -hmm. I use um, to really help me get a gauge of yeast overgrowth and the fungal markers. So um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of us have underlying infections in our gut and the underlying infections in our gut are creating lots of inflammation, food sensitivities, hormone imbalances. I mean, it affects everything. So. And parasites, right? Like you don't have to have gone to Africa and gotten sick to have a parasite. We have parasites here too. You know, I mean, international travel probably plays a role in that. Um, but, but it's an issue. When I lived in Austin, they were saying um, to people with HIV AIDS, they put out a warning, um, the health department. They said, don't drink the water. There's uh, you know, low levels of this parasite in the water. So if you have HIV AIDS or are on chemotherapy, you shouldn't drink it. And I'm like, I might not drink it either. You know, <laughs> don't want to. Yeah. So, it, and it is, and so your protocol here, when you see someone, so if someone came to you with um, fertility issues, you would look at a Dutch and a food sensitivity and then a GI map. Is that what you would do? You know, I really like to do organic acid testing. So okay. I would, I would add that in there ideally as well. And I might actually do the Dutch a little later. Like I really like to address the gut stuff first mm -hmm. and then sort of look at a Dutch for some people, but it depends. I mean, and with fertility, like you said, there's a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the patient and what resources they have. And like, I, I also try to work with people individually and like make sure they don't feel too overwhelmed with four kits in their hand and, Absolutely. you know that they're okay. But I really like to at least do a GI map once on patients to make sure that we're not missing some undiagnosed parasite or, you know, I mean, I think that most people have some degree of dysbiosis. You know, we work on that a lot, but uh, generally with herbs, but um, I'll use prescriptions too sometimes, uh, especially, you know, if it's fertility and there's like a big timeline, mm -hmm. um, I will, I'll use them then. So. 
Yeah, is that for when? When would you bring bring that in? So sure. mostly for antifungals um, and sometimes for SIBO. I really, before I treat SIBO, I want to know what the yeast markers look like on a moat or an oat test. Um, so the Great Plains test has number one through nine are yeast markers. And so if I see somebody with a heavy yeast or candida burden, I really want to treat that first or use herbs to treat SIBO. Um, because when I've used antibiotics to treat SIBO, the yeast can just sort of blow up sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm mean, talking about Zyfaxin, right? Like sometimes I'll use Alinea too for parasites. And then what about, yeah, you know, like low stomach acid here? Yeah, that's interesting. So I have people do an HCL test. Like I'll have them buy a bottle of HCL, take one with a meal, see how they feel. They don't feel it. Take two with the next meal and so on. I mean, it's a cheap way of testing for low stomach acid. Um, you know, and sometimes they get up to like seven or eight and they write me and they're like, Hey, I, you know, I don't feel anything. Am I supposed to feel something? I'm like, well, that's definitely hypochlorhydria. Mm -hmm. I actually had that too. And it sucks to take like six or eight pills with a meal, you know, but we really have to support stomach acid and break the food down. I mean, I think that is another important thing that you mentioned because it's part of addressing these underlying gut infections. If you have hypochlorhydria, you're more likely to have SIBO or CIFO or parasites because you're not killing the stuff off in your stomach and also more likely to have undigested food particles which elicit an immune response. And that goes back to, there's a paper looking at PPIs, um, acid blocking medications, Mm -hmm. and people who are on acid blocking medications tend to have more food allergies. Yeah, I think that's a really important one to address, so. Then as far as uh, nutritional deficiencies and um, the link with skin or fertility, a lot of times we're we're seeing a, a large amount of people that come to us have been on birth control. Yeah. On Dr. Jolene Brighton's new. Uh, oh yeah, new love her. Beyond you know, the pill, yeah, talking about post birth control, um, post birth control pill syndrome. She was on mm-hmm. the podcast, and um, yeah, talking about those um, nutritional deficiencies. So from the pill. So what are you? What are you seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a website that I use a lot. It's called Mitavin, M-Y-T-A-V-I-N, and um, that will help to show some nutritional deficiencies linked with different pharmaceuticals. So birth control obviously is a big one um, that can deplete folate, uh, but there are others, you know, so um, I think that's a really important thing to look at. And I think, you know, most of us are, are depleted in certain nutrients if we're not really mindful about repleting them. So um, uh, I think it's just a matter of sort of measuring that. Um, That's why I like to do organic acid testing and then put people on a really, you know, I think most people, if not everybody, need a really good multivitamin, like not something from Target or Walgreens, but something that's very high quality pharmaceutical grade um, and has, you know, some amounts of vitamin A and zinc and vitamin D and uh, selenium and methyl folate, methyl B12, B6. I mean, we need extra support because our food supply is really depleted. Mm -hmm. And then there's the gut health piece. So like if we have hypochlorhydria or we have some gut infection, especially SIBO or CIFO, CIFO, small intestine fungal overgrowth, and we're having malabsorption of foods, you know, what are we going to do about that? So sometimes when there's people who have a lot of really um, overt digestive symptoms, I'll actually... I'll use um, some of the sublingual kind of liposomal um, supplements, or I really am a fan of IV vitamins for some people. I used them myself and they was like hugely helpful when I was struggling. Yeah, I use them as well. Yeah, and as far as the connection with, with stress and gut health, digestion, I guess kind of backtrack a little bit. So a lot of times when we, when we think if there's a gut issue, we only think that it's got to be something going on with my with my digestion. You know, I've got bloating or gas, or yeah. I've got something going on in my stomach. Where where it could be, it could present as a skin issue. So acne, psoriasis, eczema, all, all these things. It could present as joint uh, joint issues. It could present as mood. Um, so ADD or depression, anxiety. It could present as an autoimmune disease. So. Um, and I think to, to be clear on that, that it's, that it's not always just like, oh, I've got, because that was me. I had no problems with digestion. Oh, yeah. Food sensitivities and gut infections. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it showed up for skin and for like a, like a, weird, yeast, a weird fungal rash on my chest, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. I think, I think, I mean, that just goes back to the importance of there's something going on, whether it's, you know, infertility or 
a skin rash or even mood, I think it's really important to look at the gut. Um, there's this, you know, obviously a very important gut brain connection. Um, and our, I mean, it, that's something, you know, in conventional medicine we've recognized for years, we've called it IBS, right? What it like irritable bowel syndrome, like, well, why are your bowels irritated? It has always been my question, but there's always, you know, we've known there's some association um, between mental health or stress and gut health. And now, you know, we know that it's the enteric nervous system is highly influenced um, by your brain and that your brain influences your gut. Just an aside, it's also interesting, like people who have had concussions, that can be the nidus for um, digestive issues. So yeah, it's a two-way street for sure. So what do you mean by that? So having a concussion can kind of then... Yeah. So if you've had like some patients, I've worked with a couple who have had um, concussion and then they've developed quote IBS after that. That's uh, that's an interesting connection, isn't it? Um, so I guess if we dig piece, if we dig into the stress connection. Um, so with, with lifestyle and how that impacts our, our gut and digestion. What are yeah. Things that yeah. I mean, it's super important. Stress Um, plays a big role in motility. So motility is really important when it comes to SIBO and CIFO. So you're going to have overgrowth of bacteria in the small gut if you're really not pushing it out um, or, you know, moving it forward as it should be if it's just kind of stagnant. So it's, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system are these things that we don't think about. They're autonomic, so they happen on their own. But parasympathetic is rest and digest. Sympathetic is fight and flight. So that's important. You know, we need a sympathetic nervous system. That is our survival mechanism. Um, There's times when we need to, you know, go in a high gear and get into that sympathetic mode. But for most people in the United States, it's a very cultural thing. We are sympathetic dominant. And so it's really important to train that parasympathetic nervous system um, and to eat and be really mindful when we eat that we're not, you know, angry or, I mean, that doesn't do any good for our, our digestion, you know? So I think just really... Um, working on the parasympathetic nervous system is important. One of my favorite tools to use is called Muse Meditation. Mm-hmm. It's like a, it's a headband. It's basically neurofeedback. And so it helps you sort of get into this meditative state. Um, I, when I do my, when I use them, my Muse, it's, for me, it's like really reminiscent of yoga. So when you get into this place with, uh, you know, I've been doing yoga for like several decades now, but you know, you kind of get into this place, this calm sort of place and work on your breath, but it can be lots of different things. I mean, I think, um, I think it's just one of those individual things that depends on the, on the person, but Muse is my favorite way. Yeah. I noticed the Muse, Muse, um, level two or, or version two now has a heart rate vari- a variability. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I like heart rate variability stuff too. It's just Muse yeah, is my Muse favorite. Heart, heart math. So have you done the level two yet? The Muse no, one? I haven't got no. I don't have Muse. I was I, thought, cool. oh, I just got the Heart Math one, and I yeah, yeah. That it's it's so cool because you can see when when you're meditating that you're you know doing your to do list and not really actually meditating. I can see right, yeah, totally. Coherence has gone down, and I haven't. I was like, oh, maybe I should get the Muse to see. So how do do you find tracking there that you're able to to see when you're off or like? Yeah, how that yeah. So it works like you put the this little headband kind of behind your ears, and then. Um, you just kind of wait. And when you get into this happy spot, there's little birds that chirp. Oh. Uh-huh. And then, you know, the more chirping birds, then you get points. So for type A people like me, you know, points. Like, <laughs> yeah, I love points. I got an A. <laughs> no, I think that's cool though. Cause I think sometimes people, they could be, people could be meditating for years and years, but if they're actually not getting into that sweet spot, yeah. it, yeah. it yeah. really be any good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I do now um, personally is neurofeedback. So that is a much more sophisticated way of the muse. The muse is sort of like, you know, one size fits all kind of thing. Um, And that isn't always, you know, the best. So I actually go um, for neurofeedback sessions now. So we'll see. I think it's helpful. What does that look like? So um, they do something called a brain map where they look at um, certain brain waves like your delta and theta waves and things like that. And it's super interesting when they read it, um, which is why I was convinced to do it. So, um, uh, 
I mean, you know, basically they can tell a lot about your personality depending on the kind of brainwaves that they see on this brain map. And then they develop a protocol to help up train some and down train others um, to hopefully make you feel more balanced. And, you know, it can help with mood and anxiety and sleep. And um, for me, it's helped me to be a more patient mother, actually. Um, and that was my goal. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Patience. <laughs> yeah. Three kids, you know, I'm like, I don't know. I gotta, I gotta do some neurofeedback for that one. <laughs> exactly. So is that a, um, like a psychologist you go to for that or how? Uh, that? They are actually licensed professional, professional counselors, but, okay. um, there's not a lot of counseling happening. Like mm-hmm. there's, there's not a lot of talking that happens. Um, so when I go for the sessions, um, it's like the first session, they were like, okay, they put a cap on your head and like these electrodes. And um, he's like, well, what show do you want to watch? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm going to watch a show like TV. So yeah, I actually watch TV and they put on something on the screen and they play certain sounds um, that influence different areas of your brain. I feel like I saw that in the documentary Heal. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't see that one. Yeah. that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. super like, well, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. The heel heel documentary was out on, on iTunes. It's just come out on Netflix as of Feb 1st. Everyone's been talking about it. Uh, Dr. Ke- Kelly Brogan's in it. So she was, oh, she is. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. yeah. So oh, cool. I'll have to go watch it. Uh, it's really good. And um, I thought there was someone in there kind of doing something like that. Cause he was, the person was just lying there and uh, he was tracking things. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to go look. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think it's also really important. It's like one of those um, new sorts of therapies. And so I think it's really important that you're doing it with somebody who knows what they're doing because there's not a lot of regulation there. And I don't actually think that everybody really knows. And I, you know, there are adverse side effects from that too. Hmm. I mean, you know, I started really reading about like, what are the adverse effects from doing neurofeedback? Like what if somebody does the wrong protocol? And, um, yeah, they exist for sure. Oh dear. Okay. What would they, what would those be? Um, you know, the ones I was reading about, it was like, um, a collection of different cases where people had sort of worked on different areas of the brain and somebody started like peeing the bed at night or something. Um, this was with a kid who had, I think ADHD or or something like that. But, um, Yeah. I don't, I mean, I think it can make people feel more irritable instead of less irritable, you know, can affect mood. Mm -hmm. Um, sleep. One of the things I noticed actually is I started dreaming again. I mean, I think, or at least remembering my dreams. Um, but I think, you know, it can make people have sleep disturbance, irritability, things like that. And then what about some, um, some non-toxic skincare products, anything that you recommend? Oh, yeah. I'm like a huge beauty counter fan. I'm like such a junkie that I even sell it now. Um, <laughs> so I'm a big fan of all things beauty counter just because I feel like it's safe and effective. Um, I also like, you know, for deodorant, I use native. I like native a lot and I like Schmitz. Um, for tampons, I think those are really important that you don't, you know, for people who actually use them, if you're not doing the diva cup, I like Lola a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we have, I like well, um, well people from Texas. I used to use them. Um, and that's pretty good stuff, you know, when it comes to, they have good makeup products that are non-toxic, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously, as you know, super important to pick the non-toxic stuff, but we have a lot of really good options now. Yeah. There's some really good options. And that's literally when we start working with someone, it's when we say, okay, let's, the first thing you need to do is change your feminine hygiene products. Cause a lot of people are still using yeah, conventional stuff, which is sprayed with glyphosate and yep. all sorts of uh, toxins, and you're putting it up your most intimate area. Uh huh. Kind of. Right. So yeah. It's so crazy that it's even a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So as far as anything that you're obsessed right now, be, be it a book, a website, an app, anything you just love and want to share. Um, with? this is a funny obsession. I'm obsessed with Branch Basics lately, which is a cleaning product. Um, I love them. They have this like cleaning concentrate that you mix with water. And then I add my like little doTERRA essential oils to, um, that's something I am obsessed with lately. And my other obsession is smoothie box. Um, like literally this morning, I don't know what to do right now because my smoothies are out. They deliver these little like packets of pre-assembled smoothies that have a little bit of fruit, but not too much. 
um, some vegetables, like one of them has sweet potato in there, um, some seeds like sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds. Um, so they're like, they're very low in sugar, especially when it comes to a smoothie. And then you put some collagen in there and it's like, that's my breakfast every morning. It's my go-to. So those are, are probably my big obsessions lately. Um, what else? Um, any apps I've been using lately? I mean, my latest thing really has been like this smoothie box, neurofeedback and cleaning my house, apparently. <laughs> And the, the smoothie Step box in the right is, direction, you know, there you go. The smoothie box. So that just comes like once for the week, then they're frozen and you're good. They to go. send, well, I get like a month at a time and I have okay. a subscription and they send a box of, um, I get like a mix of, they have clementine green and cacao. Mm-hmm. So I just get like a little bit of all of them and mix it up. Um, yeah. And then you just kind of cut them up. I add some, coconut milk, Mm -hmm. some so delicious coconut milk. And I add a little bit of the forager plain kefir, which is cashew milk kefir. Um, So I get some probiotics in there and then I add a little bit of vitamin C powder to it, blend it up. And I've got my, my smoothie for the day. I used to make smoothies. I mean, every morning and I'd use the vital proteins collagen in there and I'd put berries and like cauliflower and broccoli. Um, And sometimes it was like swamp water and sometimes it was good. You know, it just really depends. Um, so, but I was like opening 10 different bags in the freezer, you know, it just was like, it's just a process. And I have three kids that I got to get ready in the morning. I'm still breastfeeding my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, time is, um, time is a hot commodity. So, you know, rip and open a bag. And then I feel like, okay, great. I've I've got a bunch of plants for breakfast, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're like, okay, check. Done. Uh Check. Like I try to, you know, eat a lot of plants. So mm-hmm. is there a success story you'd like to share with us? Maybe something around. Yeah. Here? Um, there is somebody who's going to have her baby any day now. She is an awesome patient who I got to know maybe a year and a half ago. She came to see me, maybe a little less, maybe a year ago. Um, so she came to see me because she had chronic digestive issues and had been trying to get pregnant working with a midwife. And the midwife actually ran her thyroid test and they ran a full thyroid panel, mm-hmm. I think on her request, I'm not sure. And they discovered that she had Hashimoto's. So she was making actual thyroid antibodies. Her thyroid function really wasn't that off, um, but she did obviously have Hashimoto's and um, some autoimmune thyroid stuff going on. And um, I'm going to actually pull her chart up so I can tell you um, how her antibodies have done. But so we did um, a SIBO breath test on her. We did an organic acid test on her. We did a GI map. Um, <clears throat> we did food sensitivity testing too. Mm-hmm. And um, let me go to her chart. So she, we treated her for fungal issues and for SIBO. We used herbs and then we also used antifungal medications. I think an statin was what we used. And, um, we also ended up putting her on LDN, low dose naltrexone. So I don't know, I'm sure you've talked about this in other podcasts, but this is a medication that's used off label. Um, side effect profile is really pretty low. And I found that it can help women get pregnant, also help with autoimmunity and help with SIBO. So for her, it was like, we're working on fertility. We're working on optimizing, um, her gut function and antibodies. And so anyways, we used LDN. She felt like it really helped. Um, and she has done awesome. Um, so this is her, I love checking thyroid antibodies because, you know, you see a lot of feedback. So her thyroid peroxidase antibody was 263. It went to 183, then 125, then 72, then 33. So it's just really awesome to see, like, you can have an objective measure that the work we're doing is actually making a difference. And she also was like, for the first time in my life, I am having a normal poop. Thank Mm. God. Like it just was a total change in her, um, her GI issues. She had sort of, she had had a long history of like seeing a gastroenterologist. She went to an admission trip um, and got really sick in high school. And so they had, she had been questionably diagnosed with celiac. They really weren't sure. As you know, that can be a complicated diagnosis. Um, and some questionable, maybe IBD, di- uh, inflammatory bowel disease diagnosis. But anyways, her, her gut function got a lot better. We treated her with candybactin air and BR. And um, following that, her Hashimoto's got a lot better. And 
initially we put her on a really like tiny baby dose of thyroid hormone, but she's actually come off of it because her thyroid inf- function improved so much um, with the other work we did. And then she became pregnant um, and is doing awesome. And I think she's like almost at 37 weeks now. So and how long, how long did that take when y'all that? Um, let me see. So she, the first time I saw her was December of 2017. So um, I think she got pregnant, whatever 37 weeks ago was, um, <laughs> whatever, somebody has to do the math there. I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head, but let's say um, she actually, you know, she did pretty awesome, like maybe six or seven months into our work, she got pregnant. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's like a slow thing, right? Like you can't get pregnant right away. And when I'm treating people with herbs, I mean, I can't use candy back to air and BR if, if somebody's actively trying to get pregnant or, you know, I'm not going to use even nice statin, which is actually pretty darn safe, but I'm not going to use that, um, you know, for somebody who is trying hard to conceive likely, I don't know, nice statin I might consider, but, um, you know, obviously you have to be really careful about the medications you use. Low dose naltrexone is something that she continued, um, because it's actually, you know, it's safe to continue during pregnancy and actually recommended. So, um, she stayed on that one. Um, but yeah, she did great. Awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. And you have a free gift for the, the listeners here. So it's uh, 12 Ways to Detox Your Home yeah. at, at uh, drchristinemarin.com forward slash, forward slash gift. And I'll have that, the link in the show notes. But can you awesome. uh, share with listeners what they would get in that? Yeah. So that is really, I mean, it's everything I have in my own house. So I start with the really important stuff, water and air, um, and just walk people how through how to, you know, really, um, systematically sort of take these things out. So, um, you know, my favorite water filters in there, my favorite air filters in there, um, my favorite beauty counter products are in there. Um, my favorite cleaning products that I told you about, but it's just really a systematic way of getting rid of the toxic stuff and having non-toxic options to choose from. So I did it as a 12 step plan because it's, it can be really overwhelming for people. Um, so I think it's important to have this option of like, all right, one month at a time, I'm going to make one change. So this month I'm going to focus on air quality. So I, I tell people to open their doors or their windows, you know, for at least 10 minutes a day and really purge out the old air. Yes. Even when it's cold, um, but you got to get, you know, your, your indoor air quality is super important. So, um, just little tips like that. Yeah. I love that. And for, for me, it's funny. I, with the, the food side of things, I had that nailed in like so quickly. Yeah. Right. Like, environmental toxins. I don't know. Like, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Years I mean, I feel like that's everybody, right? It's yeah. like people really um, get down on the, on the food stuff, but then like, you know, you're using all the conventional products on our skin. And, you know, as women, we get exposed to so many different chemicals before we even walk out the door in the morning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing your, your words of wisdom. This is a great, great talk. And I, I appreciate you uh, sharing your story. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was a fun talk. Registration for our Mindfulness Fertility Series is now open. This is a six-week live online group program. This program is a must if you have an IUI or an IVF coming up and is essential for anyone trying to get pregnant naturally. Whether you are stuck catastrophizing about the future or ruminating about the past, we'll help you reframe your thoughts, reduce anxiety, and create a solid mindset for pregnancy success. Class starts Thursday, April the 25th, and space is very limited. Go to FabFertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on Shop Mindfulness Fertility Series to register. That's FabFertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on Shop Mindfulness Fertility Series to register. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, to 345345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. 
So for U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.yogafreebie.com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease, We treat your body's ecosystem. We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time.